When you open Sibelius 7.5 for the first time, your screen will look something similar to this. The file I'm using for this demonstration is Urban Filigree, which is a demonstration file that comes with Sibelius, just to demonstrate the interface. The interface is split into three sections. Up at the top here we have what's known as a ribbon, which is replacing the menu system from previous versions of Sibelius. Um, in the middle here is your main workspace. All this area here, this is where your score will appear and take shape. And right at the bottom, down along the bottom here, you have the information bar. So let's look at these in order. First of all, the ribbon. When Sibelius 7 was introduced, it introduced the, the ribbon. And many people who had been using previous versions threw their hands up in horror and thought, I have no idea what is going on up here. It actually makes perfect sense. Along the top you have a number of tabs. And each of these tabs contains a large number of features, tools, options, whatever you want to call them. The official Sibelius line is that they are laid out in the order in which you would create your score. So for example at the home tab is when you would uh, add your instruments, decide if you're going to work on transposing a score or not, add or change any bars you want to do. The no input tab is where you start adding notes, all sorts of options here for adding notes, anything to do with in to adding notes into the score would appear on here. Obviously there are a lot of different ways you can do that in Sibelius, so this is quite a busy tab. Notations tab is where you start adding anything else. Then you want to add maybe some text along to there, and then you want to play it. Now I don't know about anyone else, but I certainly, that's not the order I do things in. Um, so the way I tend to think of it is think about what you want to do, and then think about what the overarching category of that would be. And you'll probably find that one of these headings will cover that. So for example, if I want to do anything to do with text, I'll go to the text tab. If I want to do anything about adding notes, I'll go to the note input tab. If I want to start thinking about working with the parts, I'd look at the parts tab. To be honest, I probably wouldn't. To be honest, I would look over here, because this wee button here gives you a list of all your parts, and I would tend to do it that way. But specific things you might want to do from the parts tab. The view tab, decide what gets turned on and off etc. All the floating windows, all your hidden things, all this kind of stuff is decided from the view tab. The home tab is generally your sort of mainly, most commonly used tools. So they tend to be in the home tab. One, one tab that's a wee bit special is the file tab. It just takes you to the backstage area. Now the backstage area is where you would do stuff like save, save as, open and close and stuff and etc. stuff like that. But it also gives you, for example, the info um, tab here where you can add information to your score about title, subtitle, dedication, etc. And this is all stuff that's saved as part of the file. The recent tab here gives you your recently viewed documents. You can view the print options here. There are various things you can print and ways you can print them. You can decide to print the full score and or the parts and if you decide to print the parts, which parts you want, how many copies of them, etc, 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 plus all the, the various other print options further down here. There's a share area. Various different ways you can share. Most of these are new to Sibelius 7.5 so if you're looking at Sibelius 7 this probably won't appear. The export tab, however, will appear, and this is where you can export in various different formats, including to previous versions of Sibelius. So if, you, if you're using an earlier version, this is how you would make your current file backward compatible. Teaching area, where you can access the worksheet creator. Help tab, where you can find various, um, well, help, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's various video tutorials and uh, the reference guide is accessed from here as well. Various other options down here. So that's the ribbon. We'll look at this in a bit more detail in further videos, but it gives you an overview of what the ribbon can do. Above the ribbon up here, you have three wee tiny buttons. 
This is only in Windows, this doesn't appear on a Mac version. The save lets you save your score, so instead of having to go file save, you can just hit that button there. The undo will undo the last thing you did. So for example, if I change a note, I can undo that from there. But not only can I undo it, I can un actually undo the last, uh, th I think it's 30,000 things that I did with a score. So basically I can work my way back through however many steps I've taken. I can undo back through them. This wee tiny, tiny arrow beside me, beside the undo button here, will give me a list of what I've done. And I can step back through that list. I can go to this point here. And now, well, first of all, my undo list is much shorter because I'm now at a separate point in history from what I've been doing. But I also have now my redo options as well. Right back down to the very bottom one, which was dragging that note down. Okay, so you can see the undo and redo you can access from here. It's actually quite powerful. Your main workspace here is where you will spend a lot of your time looking at your score. Now, at the moment, the way it's set up, and this is what you will see by default, you can't, you can't actually see very much of the score because the ribbon takes up some space and this thing here takes up some space and it's not ideal. So, this is called the timeline. This is new in Sibelius 7.5. We'll talk about that in a, in a much in a lot more detail in a further video. So for the moment, I'm just going to close it here to give you a bit more screen space. The keypad I'm going to leave because you tend to use that quite a lot. I can then also zoom so I can see more of the score. Or I can zoom in when I'm working on a particular area of the score. I can do that as well quite happily. One thing about the ribbon that I haven't mentioned yet is this wee green arrow here. And what that will let me do is minimise the ribbon. So I can now see more of my score. If I need access to any of the tabs, I can just click on the tab and the tab appears. I'm going to click off of there, it disappears again. If, incidentally, that still isn't enough space for you, if you use this keyboard shortcut Control u you go into full screen mode, which basically takes away everything apart from your, your score. Again, you can still access the tabs as and when you need to, up at the top. But it gives you, that's how you can access the most amount of screen space on your particular system. And again, Control u will take you back out of there and there. You can bring the, the ribbon back. I personally tend to leave the ribbon visible. Just a personal preference. Going back again to the ribbon, one thing that it's worth mentioning is this wee box up here, Find in Ribbon. If you have a feature that you want to use, but you have no idea where it is, and you know they know that it exists because you've used it in previous versions, well, you can start typing its name in here. So, for example, um, one feature I use quite a lot is one called re-input pitches. So, if I start typing, oops, re, there's a hyphen in there. There you go. It shows me. It doesn't do it. It just shows me. If I click on there, that'll take me to it and show me where it is. And it's over there. I can then use it as and when I need to. So that's a ribbon, and once you've set up your main workspace to be the way you want, you're pretty much ready to go. The last area down here is the information bar. How much you'll use this is entirely up to yourself, but let's have a wee look at what it does. At the moment, you can see it tells me that I have five pages, and I'm looking at page one. If I was to scroll over here and select something, I'm now looking at page two. If I, for example, select a bar, I'm looking at page 2, I'm at bar 25. No, I beg your pardon, there are 25 bars in the score. I've highlighted the first violin part. Bar 7, 8 if you count the anacrusis as a bar. And I'm highlighted from beat 1 to the end of the bar, because I've selected the whole bar. That is 15 to 17.4 seconds into the bar. I'm in the edit passage mode and I'm looking at the score and concert pitch. I'm going to click off all that stuff that's relevant to that particular bar that appears. If I select a specific note, let's say this one, I get the usual information selected there, what beat it's on. I'm now on beat to 2.5, halfway through the second beat, which is 18.3 seconds into the score at the speed that it's set up at. 
the note I've selected is a C flat in octave four, normal note heads, and I'm in edit note pitch, sorry, edit note mode, and I'm in concert pitch in the score. If I were to select another note, let's say, for example, this one here on the drum part, it tells me that my note head, as well as everything else, my note head is now across. So it's, it's interesting information. Um, as I say, how much you use it is entirely um, up for debate. Personally, I tend not to use this area very much at all. It just sits there and gets on with it, and I just ignore it. One area, however, I do use is this area over here. This here is my zoom control, so I can zoom in and out of my score. Or I can use a number of shortcuts. So what I tend to use is the scroll wheel on the mouse, and I will control, hold down the control key and scroll up or down. Zooms in and out. If I don't have a mouse, if I'm using my laptop, I can use control and then the plus and minus on the numeric keypad. Do the same thing. And all they're doing is selecting different values for the zoom over here. These wee buttons here determine how the page, how the, the score looks on the screen. Now at the moment, and again by default, Sibelius goes into what's called spreads, which is two pages joined together. So every second page is joined together. The idea being that if when you, when you print this out, these are how your pages will come out of the printer. I mean, these are the ones that you join together. It's horizontal at the moment, so I'm scrolling from side to side to see them. I can do it, if I prefer, vertically. Some people prefer that. If they're used to working with, for example, PDF files, they tend to work vertically, so some people prefer that. I also have the option, though, of taking the spreads option away, so it's just single pages. And again, sometimes it's easier to think like that, so you have, you're have you not just trying to decide about page terms and stuff here. Let's be deal with that. And again, you can do that horizontally or vertically. It's entirely up to yourself. The last view button here is what's called Panorama, and that takes the whole page aspect of things away altogether. And what you actually end up with is one long, continuous score. Personally speaking, I tend to do most of my music creation in panorama mode, simply because I prefer not to have to think about pages and page turns and page ends and all that kind of malarkey. I prefer just to worry about the notes I'm putting in. So that's a very quick overview of the interface in Sibelius. There will now follow a whole series of videos detailing how to use each of the features and each of the techniques involved in Sibelius in a lot more detail. I hope you enjoy them. I look forward to seeing you then.